And in one of the most vulnerable positions in my life, what I didn't do was have enough courage to ask for help when I needed it most. And so it started to shatter my belief on this mental narrative and mindset as the only way. And there's a lot more evolution that came from that. But what I did is I shifted that whole next period of my life towards human connection. I started to focus really intently on vulnerability and authenticity. I believe that those are the two pieces of glue that binds human connection. And so that whole next period of my life, I started to focus on, I cannot start, I cannot keep protecting myself at the level that I am if I want to connect with people in the way that I desire. And so that was the big shift that started to launch probably the last 17 or 18 years of my life. So if you're anything like me, you always struggle with this whole thing. I see it all over the place about your true, authentic self. Um, something I wrestle with a lot, right? Because mm -hmm. you know that I love um, this idea. Be and, and look, it's, it's I love the idea um, Todd Herman talks about alter ego. Right. Because for me, that was huge. An understanding of this idea of alter ego and being able to create um, this alter ego that would be someone that could do a podcast, someone that could speak on a stage, someone that would be a little more extroverted in an introvert's body. Then we have this like whole, you know, Todd says there's no such thing as your true, true authentic, authentic self. self right. But then we have this whole concept, right? Like everybody would love to be able to show up as they truly are. You have a lot of these people who do you and, you know, all of these things. And man, what it does is it causes it causes a lot of confusion and conflict in your own mind. And then that leads to insecurity. Yeah. You don't know, you know, it's kind of like, I don't know what to do with my hands. And you go into <laughs> scenarios, right? Where, you know, even business dealings, even dealing with your uh, with your staff, with your employees, right. dealing with your significant other and this whole sort of identity crisis that gets created. And you layer that on with everything that's going on in the world. So all these things are happening. Who should I show up as? I'm worried, but I can't show the world that I'm worried. I need to make sure that everybody feels confident. And all of these things, these conflicts that get created, and then conflict always leads to destruction. Yeah. Right? And we're in a time where you know, businesses are struggling. People in general are struggling. And we have done different podcasts and work content on leadership and important leadership is. So I'm super excited about today because we're going to dive into this topic with Brian Boger. Um, you've probably seen him around. He is blowing up all over social media, in, um, in the speaking space, in coaching circles. He's helping tons of people. He's making massive impact. And somebody who's doing all of that has to come on the None of Your Business podcast. So let's bring Brian Boger in. Brian, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast today. I'm excited about it. You know, you, you said that whole like, I don't know what to do with my hands thing. And I know I wasn't on screen, but my hands started just raising. I was <laughs> starting to die laughing. I'm like, yeah, this is going to be a fun one. So I'm happy to be here. It's definitely going to be a fun one. Here's what happens. Someone like you, you know, you're gaining so much traction, so much momentum. Um, not to say that you didn't have it before, but I mean, you're literally, you're showing up everywhere. So many people are, 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 are dialing into your content. So many people are being impacted. We always start the podcast off with this question because, if I see you all over the place, well, you really have it together. Um, you always say really smart and articulate thing. And people always think that, well, that's because it's Brian. Like Brian, it, you know, Brian's, uh, you know, mom and dad were leadership coaches and they were wise mentors and they taught him all. He's had every break. And of course, if you have, you know, if you were gifted $5 million from your parents at the age of 18, <laughs> of course, everything just goes perfectly for you. What is your real creation story? How do you end up here talking to us? Why does everybody want to listen to you? Yeah, so I actually ask myself that every single morning. I'm not actually sure why anybody wants to listen to me, but uh, I'm grateful that they do. And, you know, the reality of it is, is my mission in life at this point, my purpose is very, very clear. It's to allow my truth to give others permission to live theirs. And so just very simplistically, like that's I wake up every day. I'm one that still suffers from imposter syndrome and often wondering why or how I'm going to add value. But I think. 
the core story, which I never wanted to be identified as, but clearly creates enough attention and separation that it at least opens up people's minds, hearts, and souls to receive the message then that's going to be delivered. And so I'll start with that. Um, and I'm going to give the abbreviated version because I know the timetable that we're on today, and I want to make sure I add as much value and not as much about just my story. But I think it's important for everybody to understand this. You know, my mom, my brother, and I, when I was seven years old, went to our local Walmart to get a one-inch paintbrush. And as we were headed to the car, anybody who's known me for about more than five seconds knows that I talk fast, I've got a lot of energy, and I've got a lot of excitement for life. And so I was the first one in the car waiting to get home to put that paintbrush to use. And as I was waiting by the car, my mom, right, this was back in the days before key fobs, had to fumble in her purse, grab the keys to stick it in the door and physically turn the key. And as I was standing there waiting, there was a truck that pulls up in front of the store, parks, and the driver and middle passenger get out. Now, the passenger all the way to the right started to feel the truck moving backwards. So he did what any one of us would do and scooted over to put his foot on the brake, but he instead hit the gas. Combination of shock and force threw him up on the steering wheel, up on the dashboard, and before you know it, he's catapulting 40 miles an hour across the parking lot right at me with no time to react. I was, we were parked in an end spot. He went up and over the median, went up to the tree in the median, hit our car, knocked me over, ran over me diagonally, tearing my spleen, leaving a tire track scar on my stomach, and then continuing on to completely sever my left arm from my body. My mom and my brother watched that whole thing happen. It was August 10th, 1992, 115 degree day. They look down, they see me laying on the ground and they look up and 10 feet away is my arm. Now, fortunately for me, and I have to put this part, every time I tell the story, I have to honor this woman because my guardian angel was also there. There was a nurse that walked out of the store right when this took place and she saw the literal life and limb scenario in front of her. I am forever indebted to this woman for choosing to move into action versus just turn her head and go on with her day. She came over and stopped the bleeding on the main wound and saved my life. And she instructed some innocent bystanders to run inside, grab a cooler, and get my detached limb on ice within minutes to give me a fighting chance of having a reattached limb. And so I know we're going to go in a bunch of different directions today, but I want to at least pause and just say, look, I know that most of your listeners were not expecting it to go there today. I realize that I have a very unique story, which has caught a lot of attention. But what I also want to be clear on is the more I've done this, the more I'm also very clear that we all, every single one of us, have unique stories. Regardless of the extremities of those stories, we all have them. And we all have the ability to pause and become aware of the lessons we can extract from our stories and then become intentional with how do we apply them in our lives. We all have that ability. We also all have the ability to tap into the wisdom of other people's stories to shorten our own curve to learning. I, you know, uh, there's a line that I heard once and they say, they said there's uh, never losses, only lessons. And I think that that is a beautiful description of you. And I remember listening to you the first time hearing your story. And then from there, you moving on to talk about what we're going to talk about today, the stuff that you're teaching, um, your message, the way that you're impacting people. And I feel like that encompasses your life. Like you look at the lesson in that and you've been able to look at that, the lesson in that to live your truth so that other people could live theirs. And that is so powerful to me. And it's just a reminder for me that then when things happen in my life, um, no matter how big or how small they are, the lesson can always be extracted. And I know yeah. that that's what behind a lot uh, behind what you do. Yeah. In fact, one of the core lessons, one of the key critical lessons that I learned very, very early and I apply in so much of my life, it, it epitomizes what you just said. It's I learned very early not to get stuck by what has happened to me, but instead get moved by what I can do with it. And what I've learned in all this time is the more I move through those things and the more I move those messages and lessons through the world, the more it moves people. And again, we're on a mission to impact a billion lives, right? That's a common mission I share with one of our common co-friends, -co Mr. Meltzer. But the reality of it is, is the only way to get there is collectively. But what I know is that moved people move people. And so right. it's about getting all of our lessons and all of our intentionality out there so that we can connect on it, bind on it, and actually help each other move forward. Because that's what we all want. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about your truth. You said that, you know, that's that's the driving force here. Um, and I think you know that was what I opened with. I think there's a lot of confusion in the world um, about what does that mean? My, what is my truth? Let's start with your truth. So if you're living an expression of your truth, um, what what does that mean? What is your truth? I love that question. Uh, in fact, that might be the first time somebody's actually asked me that. Um, and so I appreciate that deeply. My truth is that first and foremost, I'm a father and husband. And I just told you that we're on a mission to impact a billion lives, but none of the work that I do in impacting anybody else's lives matters at all if my wife and my kids are not good. So I always center there first. I center in myself first, then I center in my family. And then beyond that, everything else 
is allowing myself to realize that, look, my life, I'm kind of a practitioner of pain, physical pain, mental pain, spiritual pain, uh, and, and hypothetical pain in so many cases. And so the reality of it is, is that I, in my entire life, had layers of pain that were being developed within me. And for every single time I developed a layer of pain, I developed a simultaneous layer of armor on the outside. And so really for the last 10 to 15 years, since I started to get enough awareness to understand that I wasn't living based on who I am, that I had actually chased all the what's of the world, what house, what car, what amount of money and accomplished it all, that I'd lost who I was, which also meant I'd lost my truth. I'd lost my creativity, my intellectual curiosity, my desire for human experience and human connection. And so the reality of it is, is I, for the last 10 to 15 years, have just been on a process of simultaneously healing layers of pain from the inside out. And then at the same time, shedding those layers of armor that have prevented me from demonstrating who I am to the world or having people be able to see and understand and connect with me. So who I am, my truth is that I know what it's like to be miserable. I know what it's like to be lost. I know what it's like to be absolutely suffering in my day-to-day -day life. I also know what it's like to embrace the pains required to avoid suffering and gain freedom in my life. I know what it's like to be over here in misery, darkness, and despair. I also know what it's like to live completely and fully with the absolute abundant energy that allows joy, freedom, and fulfillment to flow through me authentically based on who I am. My truth is that I no longer deny the things that bother me. I no longer turn my head to the things that the world has told me to do. I don't want to be who the world has told me to be. I'm going to be me. And the more I can just be, the more I am. I'm just listening to you. And I, I, I'm one of the things that Sean and I always try to do is we try to put ourselves like in the space of the listener. And I'm thinking, God, there's so many people out there that tell themselves, yeah, but you don't know my story. Right. And they, they identify with the story and not the way that you identify with your story. Like you said, they identify with the story in a way that they've created limitations. Anchor. They've, they've built up our, yep. they've built up armor. It's yeah. It's an, it's an anchor to the direction or life that they're living now, not the life that they could be living in, right? It's anchored them to the spot that they exist in. So there had to be a moment for you where you 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 pivoted, where you were like, I'm not doing this anymore. I need to work on myself. Like, first yeah. off, what did that moment look like? And what words do you have for somebody that hasn't reached that yet? Yeah, so I, I have to be honest, there've been many, many moments. And they continue to layer in themselves and they continue to make me go deeper. And I think one thing that I'm very clear on is my work is not done. I'm here and I teach other people, but there is no final destination. There's only constant evolution of self. So I have to start before I answer that because anybody who's listening, I want to make sure that you hear that. It doesn't matter where you are today. It matters where you're going. And we've all been stuck. We'll all be stuck again. It's just not okay to stay there. And right. so one of the most pivotal moments for me was the start and transition between this concept and belief that mental toughness and a mental narrative were going to be the things that dro drove me towards success. I mean, how many people are out there just promoting like, you just need a strong mindset. If you've got a strong mindset, you can do anything. And guess what? You can do a lot with a strong mindset. But I'll tell you that right after my accident, I developed a very strong mental and intellectual narrative that was, again, armor based on protecting myself. Two things happened. I have my accident. I leave the room. And all of a sudden, I'm in a sling with a teddy bear sitting here in the middle. My arm's got to be at 90 degrees. And I got very used to seeing jaws hit the floor because people would ask me, hey, Brian, what happened to you? Expecting me to say, oh, I fell off my bike. I jumped off the jungle gym. Anything typical for a seven-year-old boy to have broken their arm. But instead, my truth, which was I got run over by a truck and my arm got torn off. Now, immediately, 99% of people would hear me say that. Their jaw would hit the floor and then they'd turn and pivot and look at my parents for validation. They didn't believe my own truth. My own story, my own reality wasn't believed and accepted. The second thing is that those same individuals started to view me through their lens on what they'd be capable of in my situation and started putting limitations on me. And I wasn't going to allow that to happen. So both of those things caused me to armor up and I created this mental narrative. I'm good. I'm strong. I'm tough. I can do anything and I don't need anybody's help. And it served me very well for a long time. I overcame a whole lot of things. I accomplished a lot and had all this amazing growth and trajectory in my life, constantly breaking the expectations and limitations from what people expected. Then when I'm 20 years old, doing just that thing, snowboarding in a trick park, because that was something that I did to get my rush threshold back up, I went down and I rebroke my left arm. I almost lost it again. Compound fracture. Went through seven surgeons over the next 10 months who were afraid to touch me because of medical malpractice. And at any moment, the wiggling bone inside could cut through some of the veins, through some of the nerves that had been reestablished in one of the 24 surgeries that got me there. 
Well, all of a sudden, nobody was there for me. And it wasn't that I didn't have friends. It wasn't that I didn't have family. It wasn't that people didn't love me and wanted to be there and care for me. It's that I realized the power of my narrative for the very first time. The world believed what I'd been promoting. Brian's good. Brian's strong. He's capable. He can do anything. He doesn't need our help. And oh, by the way, if he needs it, he'll ask for it. Here's the catch. I wasn't in a position to receive at that point. And in one of the most vulnerable positions in my life, what I didn't do was have enough courage to ask for help when I needed it most. And so it started to shatter my belief on this mental narrative and mindset as the only way. And there's a lot more evolution that came from that. But what I did is I shifted that whole next period of my life towards human connection. I started to focus really intently on vulnerability and authenticity. I believe that those are the two pieces of glue that binds human connection. And so that whole next period of my life, I started to focus on, I cannot start, I cannot keep protecting myself at the level that I am if I want to connect with people in the way that I desire. And so that was the big shift that started to launch probably the last 17 or 18 years of my life. So um, we're not attacking an individual, I said in the, in the beginning, um, because so that leads me to then we're, we're right here to this crossroad. Um, and I'm a big fan of Todd Herman and his work, The Alter Ego Effect. In essence, you had created an alter ego. Mm -hmm. Super strong. Ryan, don't worry about it. I got it. I handled it. And then the people, the world started to buy into it. It's part of the premise. Right. right? Todd's, Todd's work. Um, but your perspective on that, you were like, look, so, you know, maybe I need to dive deeper. The alter ego can be a protective mechanism. Um, the alter ego can be a, a mechanism that uh, we utilize to drive success that allows us to walk into certain rooms that maybe we would not walk into without, as you said, that armor of protection. Yeah. Um, what is your take on that? Is the real, are you, do you feel like you're in pursuit of the true authentic Brian or um, are we still sort of constantly managing multiple alter egos that are environmentally and situationally dependent? <laughs> That's a great question. I love the depth of that question. Um, what I would tell you is that I am in true pursuit of who I am. There is no alter ego. And I would tell you, and you guys have both met me in person. I'm the same person on video as I am on podcasts, as I am on stage, as I am when I'm talking to anybody. But I wasn't always that way. Right. And I got so tired of not being who I was or to do certain things that would numb elements of who I was so that I could lean into the situation, the environment that I was in so that I could be seen and, and, and connected. What I've started to really understand is that the human experience in my perspective is really rooted in four key areas that we all seek and desire. We all seek and desire to feel safe. We all seek and desire to feel protected. We all seek and desire to feel seen and understood. And we all seek and desire to feel protected. Oh, by the way, these last two are the two that we all seek and desire the most, but they don't happen unless the first two do. So when we walk into these environments that you're talking about, these conditioned environments where our alter ego would allow us to have our Superman suit on anytime we walked in, what that suggests is that when we walk into those environments, we don't feel protected and we don't feel safe. And when we don't feel either of those two things, what we tend to do is to protect ourselves. So we've talked a little bit about armor. Alter egos are armor. They're just a different way of talking about it. And so if you think about armor, armor does three things. If I protect myself, I've now put this invisible force field of protection of armor around me that's guaranteeing that the two things I desire most, to be seen and understood and to be connected, don't happen because I cannot properly portray my most authentic self through the armor or through the alter ego, nor can the people on the other side actually see me clearly through that invisible force field. So it prevents us from having being seen, understood and connected, but the armor does two other things. And we just don't ever talk about this. Right? So I'm going to ask the two of you a question real fast. Actually, I'm going to ask Sean because I think Lacey could kick your butt at this. So I'm just going to own this for what it is. Let's say you had two five pound dumbbells. Put them out in front of you. How long can you hold them there? Two five pound dumbbells? Mm. <laughs> Three and a half minutes. I love it. I'll bet you Lacey could, Lacey could do five. I'm just saying. I can see it in her. She's got all this <laughs> For fire. Sure. But here's the deal, right? So what happens? You hold them out there. 10 seconds in, you start to feel it. 30 seconds in, you definitely start to feel it. By three and a half minutes, if you make it that far, they're heavy. Mm -hmm. Right? The thing is, is armor is no different. The longer we carry it, the heavier it gets. We think it's protecting us, but what it's actually doing is incrementally crushing us over time and, again, preventing us from the things that we want. The other thing that happens, the third thing that happens with armor, if we aren't very intentional and careful, is that invisible container, whether it has a lid or not, act as if it's a trash can. 
When our trash can is full and we don't want to walk out to the dumpster outside, what do we do? We shove it down. It's what the world has taught us to do with who we are, with the emotions that we have, with the way we view the world. If it doesn't fit inside the box that they're willing to accept us in, then we can't be who we are. So what do we do? We put on these alter egos and these Superman suits, shove that stuff down, show up with a smile on and move fast because that's what the world wants, right? But here's the deal. Now we have this container. The more we continue to deny that stuff, whether we're intentionally or unintentionally suppressing or pushing that down, that container can only hold so much. So what's going to happen is at some point, if there's no lid, it's going to start spilling over the edges and affecting your relationships, the people in your lives, the things that you have going on. Or if you do have a lid and it's really tight, guess what? It's a container that builds with pressure that will explode and will create damage. And so the I'm really big on this concept of armor. In fact, we can talk about this knife and string concept that we have as well right now, because the reality of it is, is armor prevents us from being who we are, seeing and understanding who we are, having others see and understand who we are, and allowing ourselves to be connected. So instead, as leaders in business and in life, what I would argue is that what we need to do is convince ourselves we're safe so that we can lower our own armor and enter into those environments authentic, open. Then we can layer a wrap a protection around the entire environment that we're in, which guarantees that everybody's safe. Everybody's protected. Everybody's seen and understood and everybody's connected. Problem is there's not a lot of leaders that are willing to drop their armor long enough to make that happen. Well, it's a really interesting concept that you're talking about because I feel like when we put up this armor, this wall, or even this other personality and we show up we're doing that so that we could because we feel that's going to attract individuals into our world like i'm yep. gonna have this alter ego ego because i feel like if i show up as that person more people will like me more people will be connected with me more people will resonate me within real in the reality of it is is the energetic expenditure that you yep. have to have to show up as somebody that you truly are not when you go home because you're exhausted, because that wasn't who you are, you can't even reap the benefits of attracting those people into your world. So right. the very thing that you were trying to accomplish, you can't truly experience because it wasn't who you are in the first place. So yep. like how damaging is that over time? I mean, that's just, that's just crazy. Cause again, we're trying to do something that in reality, we can't truly we can't really extract from because it's so exhausting. Well, that's the Joe Dispenza concept, right? right. The greater the gap between who, who you are, are and who, who you appear to be, to be yes. the greater the energy that it, it is required, required to sustain that gap. Here's then the next issue. You and I had dinner in um, group format, they see as yep. well, um, where um, I didn't know a lot of people who sat next to me. So my true authentic self is, so I, I love this scene from Red uh, red crimson or crimson time crimson, crimson time yeah. <laughs> uh, denzel washington um goes out and uh they're in the submarine and they're smoking a cigar oh, the gene hackman setting. you know this says you oh, know has a cigar up. and gene hackman says good job you knew to shut up you knew to enjoy the sunset right like, this is our last breath of fresh air you knew that we didn't always have to talk we didn't have to make small talk to enjoy mm -hmm. each other's the company experience. that's me like I, I, I don't feel like we have to be constantly talking for me to be finding value energetically, um, to find value in someone's presence. But here, so here's the thing: a lot of people, I mean, and I know this, a lot of people think I'm a dick because like they, I don't talk to a lot of people. They're like, you know, he, he's a jerk. So, so how do we reconcile that? So if, if we let down the armor, then we have to deal with the reality of other people's. Um, opinions perception. or perception and then that can perpetuate so that's that vicious circle right because then you're like oh well, i don't want to feel like that because that's damaging to my I, that doesn't feel real good so let me then now put my armor back up right. and then let me go out there and fight the yeah. fight with my armor how do we break that vicious circle well so all of what you just said also implies that you being you is wrong because others have a problem with it mm -hmm. I'm just a big believer that that's something we have to start really recognizing is that we need to meet people where they are. And guess what? I'm not somebody that likes to go to networking events. I was in like one or two dedicated conversations at that dinner. I get focused. Yeah. I get engaged. I'm not one that wants to go shake everybody's hand, make sure everybody's got my business card. Like, yes, is there missed opportunity there? Yeah, sometimes if that's how you view it. But I also view it as everything's going to happen for a reason. And those people that are meant to come into my world and my life will. As long as I'm in the right place at the right time and I'm open to receive. So I think the difference with you is although you weren't outgoing, you were also very open. 
your energy was open. You weren't closed off that night. You just aren't very talkative, right? And so that's okay. I think that for us, that vicious cycle is really a, a, a dynamic of both our internal narratives and the element of what the external pressure puts on us. And how do we balance and regulate between both? Because I will tell you that for me, I used to have a real fundamental issue, right? When I wasn't clear on who I was, when I wasn't centered in that stuff, and when I was really wrapped up in my shame and judgment and how that was going to impact me, right? I would feel like I had to do something or be something or be somebody that I'm not. And even what you just said also sort of implies this, right? There's so much subtle shaming in society around everything, drinking included, by the way. It's one of the only drugs that we actively shame people for not partaking in, right? <laughs> but it's one of those things that's like fascinating because it's also one of those deals that like, again, what you just said is it's like, well, if I go to this dinner, I should be on. I should be talkative. I should be engaging. I should be connecting. I should be opening myself to these other opportunities, having these conversations. But guess what? Should is a shame-based word because it implies that whatever you're doing, whoever you are, or whatever you desire isn't good enough because it doesn't fit that bucket. So I want to be, I want to start by saying that the whole question is wrapped up with this external opinion on that's good or bad. Why don't we just start allowing people to be who they are and recognize that we all enter into the world, communicate and connect differently. And that can be okay. That's, I think, one that I'm on a big mission to do is, Sean, if you want to sit next to me at dinner and not talk all night because you're introverted and you just want to absorb and receive everything that's there, fuck, that's awesome. Let's do more of that, right? And if I need to be the one to carry the conversation, well, I have no problem talking, so I can do that for us. <laughs> but the reality of it is, like, that's what we have to start recognizing is let's stop judging people for who they are or how they show up based on our opinion of how they should show up or who they should right. be. Let's just accept them for who they are and recognize we're all different. Right. And I mean, I really think that it starts with, with yourself, right? Because you can't, Always. you can't expect other people to not judge if you're especially putting judgment on who you are yourself. Exactly. And there's a, an, a level of worthiness that has to occur. You have to feel worthy to receive. You have to feel worthy to sit in a silent space next to somebody else and feel okay about that. You have to feel yeah. worthy of the relationships that are in your world and that are coming your way. And I think a lot of people, that's what they struggle with. And, and that's why they put up armor. Because they don't also, they also don't feel like they're worthy of receiving the things that's that right. are coming their way because the person that they truly are, they feel like isn't the person that deserves that. Well, and keep in mind too, even what we just said, that whole environment suggests that that person should be doing something or should be right. somebody that they're not. So right. exactly to your point, it always starts with you first. Everything begins mm -hmm. and ends with us. And by the way, to your point exactly, I would argue that there is a large portion of our population who can't even sit in silence with themselves. Mm, true. And so if you can't sit in silence in yourself and you feel the need to fill in every gap, even in your own existence, how are you going to be in a social situation? You're only going to be triggered left and right and trying to figure out how to navigate that scenario because you don't know how to be. Love it. Website is www.brianbogert, B R I A N. B O G E R T dot com, Brian Bogert dot com. I know that everybody is getting tremendous value um, from what you are sharing. And I hope that people will, again, Lee and I say this literally every podcast. You can listen to podcasts and then you can now go online and Google Brian if you're, this is the first time you're hearing him. And then you can listen to Brian on a bunch of other podcasts and videos. But the real magic happens when you actually decide. And that's literally what we're talking about. Right. When you make a conscious decision that you're going to do something. Right. And so yep. we're encouraging you to engage with Brian. He has tons of stuff. Like it's kind of you, you, you have to make a decision to engage. And then it's not hard. Like we have sometimes have guests and we're like, how do people find you? It's not hard to find Brian. <laughs> He's everywhere. But you have to do things. If somebody is like, yeah, you're speaking to me and I know you are. I know you're speaking to so many of our listeners and so many of our viewers. Um, how does it work? How do we overcome this? You offer, obviously, guidance, mentorship, coaching to help people to break through these barriers, to overcome their armor. What are some of the, the, the tools, the strategies, how does it work if someone wants to engage with you? Yeah, so we, we are very, very clear as a team that we like to engage deeply with those that engage with us. And so one of my best friends is one of the world experts on customer journey. And so I've learned a whole lot from him on the ways that we can engage through multiple channels. So you said it, you have to take action. Shoot us a DM, shoot us a text, shoot us an email. Like we will be on it and we will respond. And our whole goal at that moment is not to sell you something, 
right? To impact a billion lives, 99.9999999% of the people that we impact will never pay us a dollar. We don't put out all this content just because. And if you follow our content, you'll see we aren't selling in most of it. We're actually just creating stuff to elevate and empower. So that is authentic. That is real. And we will engage with you. We also have multiple different ways to engage from the lowest dollar levels and free all the way up to the highest ticket items. And so our goal is not to just get you into this world so that we can pitch you everything. Because, oh, by the way, I don't think that 95% of people are ready for coaching anyway. And so if we can give you a nudge, we can give you some resource to help you in the beginning parts of your path. Awesome. And if you choose to invest with us beyond that at some point, awesome. But it starts with taking action because I don't know if you've been impacted unless you reach out. So let us know. And again, the whole concept of move people, if you get moved by this or anything we said or anything that you two do, because you guys are putting out amazing stuff as well, right? Move people, move people, move it through the world. Turn your phone and show somebody. I don't even care about the vanity metrics. Just engage. Right. I love this. And I love, I love this next question. I, I love asking this question uh, because people, um, I, Lacey and I both love getting inside the subconscious story that's in people's heads as they're listening to the podcast. I think that at this point, people are like, yeah, I can kind of see some of this, you know, even using myself as an example, your story as an example, and everybody has a story. And then they, we, we then have these adaptive mechanisms, armor that gets created in our lives. Um, when clients come to you, since we're not talking about anyone in particular, yeah. just in general, when clients come to you, what are some of the, the signs and symptoms that they have been ignoring um, these things happening, that they have built um, big, armor. thick, heavy armor and they've been carrying it around. But what are some things that we could look at in our own lives and say, hmm, yeah, that could be me. That could be me. Yeah. So I would tell you that if you are experiencing a regular and consistent flow of what I'm going to call negative emotions, your guilt, shame, imposter syndrome, anxiety, scarcity, um, those are all things that are focused on external magnification of triggers that also help create patterns. So if you are consistently in this place and you don't know how to break free, if you find yourself repeating the same patterns in your life, if you constantly feel like who you are is not good enough, or you aren't able to demonstrate who you are, or frankly, what happens with so many people that come to us, they don't even know who they are anymore. And so, so many entrepreneurs, so many business owners have lost who they are because their identity has gotten wrapped up in a bunch of different things. Now, all of a sudden, they've got these cycles in business, these ups and downs, and it's affecting their emotion. It's also affecting their ability to connect with their most intimate relationships. It's affecting their ability to connect and lead their teams of associates and, and uh, staff that works for them. And most importantly, it starts to really affect their ability to see sustained growth in their business because of their lack of ability to connect with what they're positioning and those that they're trying to impact. And so all of these things layer in as identifiers for individuals that we work with. I have a guy that I worked with for about 18 months, right at the beginning of COVID. And he was in the commercial real estate business, development, fundraising, property management. They'd hit all sides of it. Right at the beginning of COVID, he literally looked at everything on the books, told his team they have 17 months of liquidity left. They were going out of business because it was a dying industry, right? And this was in the beginning of COVID. So all the commercial spaces were starting to be wiped out. Leases were being extended. Everything was blowing up. He was on the tail end of a $600,000 settlement. And the organization owed him personally over a quarter million dollars at that time. Okay. He used to be in shape, rode his bike from coast to coast more than once in his life, lived in the same house for the prior 14 years, and they kept wanting to redo their living room, despite the fact that they didn't have the physical space anymore because their boys were 14 years older, and now all of a sudden they needed more space. All these things were falling apart. We started to get in and work, and within three months, it was very, very clear that he had a deep level of shame that came from a couple of rooted triggers in his world that existed prior to age 10 that manifested as scarcity in his world and was actually creating his inability to lower his own armor to trust his teams to do the work that they were. So he was micromanaging them. And all of what was going on on the financial side was starting to create compression, and he doesn't see the path to growth. So literally, he told them, I'm going to give you as long as I have to go find yourselves another job. Because he didn't see a path forward. He felt like everything was ending. Over the course of the next nine months, we worked deeply on this trigger, really helping him understand how it shows up, where it happens, how it moves through his body, how he can move through it in his world, how he can move through it with his relationship with his wife, his kids. Oh, by the way, his wife, a year after working together, called me and said, thank you so much. I've never met this man, but he's exactly who I want to be married to. Um, but full circle, a year and a half after him understanding that shame and scarcity were the two things impacting his life, 
They've more than tripled the size of their organization. They've closed on more eight-figure deals than they ever had in the prior period. They just did a $45 million fundraise in less than 20 days on a new project they just launched a month ago. Their teams have all gotten raises. They've moved into new houses, and he's riding his bike 120 miles a week again. Again, emotional trigger kept him stuck, but he kept going, hiring coaches, getting systems, strategies, and tactics. None of it was working because he knew how to do business. He just couldn't get out of his own way. Mm. Anybody who ever feels any of those things, who doesn't feel like they can ever get ahead, I'll quote one of my good friends, Alex Sharfin. He said, if you're constantly putting out fires in your life and your business, there's a good chance you're the arsonist. I just hold a mirror up for people to help them see themselves more clearly so they can move faster with less effort. Amazing. I love it. I have a couple of people I can refer to you. <laughs> <laughs> but that's so true, right? A lot of people. Are you looking at me? No, I'm not looking <laughs> at you. A lot of people, a lot of people. Um, that is their pattern, right? You've yeah. tried everything. You've bought all the courses. You've hired all the all the coaches. You've gone to all the programs. You've walked on fire. You did it all, but you keep you can't get out of your own to way yes. to get what you truly want. I right? love that. Yeah. And hey, that's perfect because if that's you, you need to jump over www.brianbogert.com. Um, Brian can help you. I mean, and that's something that you know. Again, you've got to extend your hand out because Brian's not coming to your house just randomly to help you. You have to reach out to him, and him and his team will be more than happy. They, it's a very heart-centered team that has a heart for service, and serving the world. So we know that they will do everything they can to accommodate you, help you. Um, if they can't help you, they'll help you to find someone who can. Fantastic time with you today, Brian. You are amazing. Absolutely killed it. Well, thank you guys for creating a platform for me to be able to pour good into the world. Uh, wouldn't be here without you. And I'm very grateful to call you both friends now. And I'm looking forward to what we do for Collective Impact together. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we value long-term relationships. We love to collaborate. Love what you have going on. We definitely will be doing some stuff together. We're going to reach a lot of people. We're going to make an even bigger impact together through collaboration and leverage. And then subsequently, of course, everybody involved, they get to create the lifestyle that they deserve because that's just the way that the universe works. We say it every single week here on None of Your Business. And hopefully each and every week you're inspired by our guests, inspired by the content, inspired by their stories to begin to slowly understand that that's the way that it works. We cannot get to where we're going. Well, we could get to where we're going alone, but it will just take a really long time. Well, I'm most importantly empowered and motivated to get up and do. Yeah, how long would it right. take to empower a billion people? I mean, it's possible, but you would take, it would take a long. It would take a long. It would take a, <laughs> imagine though you have a lot of friends helping you. He's holding those five pound weights for five minutes, bro. Like I, she just said, not that long. She's like, I got you. You got this. <laughs> this you're going to yeah, do it. It's not going to be right? that long. Well, Brian, thank you so much for being on, on the podcast. For everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. I know that you enjoyed it. I look forward to your comments, your messages. Let me know what you thought. Let Lacey know. Tell your friends about the podcast. We come, we come back with you each and every week with a brand new guest. We break down great topics. We go deep. We challenge people. We challenge you. We'd love to know what you think. Until next week. Oh,